A reminder that um, your papers are due, right? So I think you have you guys have till the end of the day to get those in. Um, how did the writing of them go, by the way? You guys, did they write themselves pretty smoothly? Um, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully all of you guys have written something at this point, right? We'll, we'll be starting it after class today, right? But how's that? How's the writing of this paper going? I was nervous at first because of the Middle English, but it was actually pretty easy. Once I got started, it was like you said, it just kind of wrote itself. Good. Which questions you pick, Brooklyn? Is the wife of Bath a proto -femin feminist or a monstrous product of uh, misogyny? Good. Kelly, you said you've been writing that over the weekend. How's, how's, how's that going for you? Um, I was nervous at first, too, because like I said before, like I've never took any of this like literature classes and I didn't really know how to start these papers because I mean, I know how to do papers because of English classes. I've took many English courses, but writing about these stories is I was nervous. Uh, I went back and rewrote like the first two pages because I felt like I didn't include enough information. But I've got like three paragraphs left to finish my last page. Good. Which questions you pick? Um, the it was the part about the partner's tale. I think it was the last question. Good, and Brad. How about you? How's the writing going for you? Yeah, the question is the question you picked, Kelly. The what do you think of the partner's tale as the moral of the story achieved despite the low ethos of the partner himself? That is that the question you picked? Yes. Yeah, I'll I'll definitely be interested to read your read that. The partner is probably my favorite of of uh, the Canterbury Tales. So it was mine too. That's why I picked it. <laughs> The wife of Bath, the most famous, but uh, yeah, I've always enjoyed the sleazy partner as well. Brad, did you have a comment on your writing so far? Silence from Brad. So. Uh, <laughs> mainly, I just lost track of the due date. I thought it was due tomorrow, so I'm behind. Well, remember, remember my rule. Uh, like I say, something is due like Monday the seventh, but I do give you a twenty-four hour window past that where I don't, where I'll still take it without penalizing you for it. So, uh, so you you still have some time. So, uh, rest easy. Okay. Okay. I was stressed out because I've only got like one page. Yeah. So. Technically, you have till tomorrow at 11.59 to get it in if you need to, okay? I appreciate it. Yeah, after that first day, that's when I start taking a penalty off if you're late. So I do give you guys that window, though, it's just in case, um, especially just in case some of y'all work or have responsibilities at home. That's why I give you that. 24 hour window. Okay. I have stressed out over mine. I just want you to remember that I've never wrote a essay on this type of stuff, but I am trying my hardest to make it good. And I hope that it's as good as like, I feel like Brooklyn's is going to be the best because I don't know. She is so, I feel like she, she knows so much more about this than any of us, but I hope mine's good. I'm working hard on it. Yeah, Brooklyn's been through this ring of a roll with me before. So uh, she knows my process. 
but I'm sure I'm sure it's better than you think, Kelly. So I look forward to reading it. I'll try to get those back to you guys this week. Uh, it obviously shouldn't take me too long to grade them since their class is so small. Um, but um, yeah, I'll try to get those back to you before the spring break, so you guys will have some feedback. If they don't turn out the way that you like the first time, let's say you get a B or C or something. I will allow a rewrite on it, so uh, a revision. So know that too. I'll give you guys a revision opportunity in case in case things don't work out. Just because writing should always be about learning and improving, rather than here's what you're doing wrong. Right? Sometimes you get feedback like here's a C. Here's why your paper sucks enough to get a C. Right. I don't I don't really like to give feedback like that. Right. I think it I like I don't I don't think that's constructive. So like if I I'll give you a grade and I'll be like, okay, here's some things you're doing good, and here's some things you can pick up improve on. And then if you want to revise it from there, that's your choice. Okay. But hopefully you guys will all get A's the first time, so you don't have to worry about it. So, um, well, with that said, then let's go ahead and get going with uh, Shakespeare. Uh, so Shakespeare's King Lear. So we're going to be spending the next three weeks with Shakespeare. So uh, King Lear this week, Othello the week after spring break, the 21st to 25th, and then 12th night from the 28th to the 1st. So now we're going to be covering a lot of Shakespeare but of you guys will hopefully have a nice foundation in Shakespeare after, after this class is over. There's a bunch of other really great Renaissance playwrights too. We're going to read one. No, no, actually we're not going to read the Duchess of Malfi. There's another really great Renaissance play called the Duchess of Malfi, but I didn't assign it for this class because it's not in our book. But um, I do. I did assign it in my other class, though. That's why I got confused. But uh, that's a good one. That's a great Renaissance tragedy as well. But um, let me kind of start us off today by talking a little bit about Shakespeare and about Shakespeare's world, and um, then we'll kind of seg. Then I'll kind of try to segue us over into discussing the play, the first bits of the play. We got a lot of work to do with figuring out who these characters are and and uh, all this good stuff. I'm switching back to speaker view here. So, um, what to say then about Shakespeare? So William Shakespeare. First, he whenever we talk about William Shakespeare, he's got a reputation. Right, he is considered the greatest writer in the English language. Most people consider him like the greatest, the greatest writer of the English language. He has that, he's an icon. He has that reputation. Um, he lived from 1564 to 1616. Um, he grew up, in, he pretty much grew up in England as this middle class kid. So he was he grew up during uh, Elizabeth I's reign as queen. So I already I already told you guys a lot about Elizabeth and how Elizabeth especially helped unify um, England after all the religious strife. You know after after her after her father Henry VIII created the Church of England, right? His daughter his older daughter Mary, Mary Queen of Scots, took over after her after him and then tried to make England Catholic again. And uh, she tried to make England Catholic again by force. She's called Bloody Mary for a reason. Well, um, eventually Elizabeth took over from her 
very much helped to unify England together from that religious standpoint, especially from a religious standpoint. But as I told you guys before, with the defeat of the Spanish Armada and all that kind of stuff, you know, England suddenly became a power on a world stage. So um, one, so King Lear is one of the themes in King Lear is actually um, what happens when somebody old gives up power, right? This this king willingly gives up his power. So the question almost even here is, what is power? How is power constructed? Like, how is it that a king gets the status of being a king? Is it just his title? Is it something else? So this is something that the play, this is a question that the, this play raises. But I bring this up in relation to Elizabeth, because as Shakespeare was writing this thing, Elizabeth was slowly decaying, growing old and decaying. I think she died in 1600. It was either 1600 or 1601 she passed. But as, as all this stuff was going on in England, Shakespeare was writing this play about what happens when someone old is getting ready to pass, right? Or what happens if someone old relinquishes their power? Uh, there was a whole big, uh, big hubbub over this because Elizabeth did not have any kids. So, um, with Elizabeth, the the uh, reign of the Tudor family that started with Henry the Seventh has now ended. So, um, by the time that King Lear actually came to stage, I think James the First actually became was a monarch by the time that this play it was actually made it to stage well, so you guys know the king james the first of scott he was james the sixth in scotland he was the king of scotland before the whole united kingdom when he became king of england um, he became james the first and with king james the, the all the different parts of England unified together in what is now called the United Kingdom. Okay, so England, uh, Scotland, Ireland. Right? Scotland and Ireland, <laughs> as you guys know, didn't go willingly. Right? There's, all, there's always been a ton of conflict between the English, the Scots, and the Irish. Mostly be between England and the Irish, mostly because of religion. That's a big part of it, but uh, colonization and all that stuff too. But most of the conflicts between England and Ireland has always been because of religion. So that's a little bit about what was going on with politics at the time, which is this play is very much a political play. But uh, what to say about the man himself, the author, um, like I said, he grew up in a middle class. He went to what was called a grammar school at the time. Um, he learned in grammar school, you learned Latin. Um, you did things like, you would read things like ancient Greek, ancient Roman literature, and the original Latin and stuff at the, in the grammar schools. So the, gra the grammar schools back then was pretty much the equivalent of like a high school education is today of course these, they would do things as well like arithmetic and sciences and things like that as well but like i said these were called grammar schools and frankly that sounds a whole hell of a lot harder than, than what high school is today right you got to learn latin and read these stories and the original latin and all this stuff right you know the that sounds a lot more challenging than high schools are today when it comes to an academic standpoint. Um, but um, and I raise all this stuff about Shakespeare's middle classness because there's actually a theory that William Shakespeare actually was not a real person. You know, there's a there's a whole conspiracy theory that argues that this guy William Shakespeare was a made up person 
they think a lot of the people who are behind this theory think that someone who just had what was a basic high school education at the time, there's no way someone like that could have written these plays. Um, frankly, to me, that's condescending, right? You know, like, I th I've, I've always, that argument's always kind of made me angry when I dwell on it. Right, because why why does what does that have to do with it? Um, but that's what a lot of people think. Even a lot of famous actors who do Shakespeare plays um, have oftentimes thought that this guy actually wasn't a real guy; that he was a fictional creation. You guys read Doctor Faustus by Christopher Marlowe. Uh, some people think that Christopher Marlowe never died, that he continued writing under the name William Shakespeare. Frankly, if you read Dr. Faustus and you read this, like the dramatic style of those two plays is so dramatically different. Um, <laughs> how could you even compare them, really? But some people think that Shakespeare was actually, was actually the, the Earl of Oxford, um, who was a famous aristocrat at the time. They think that he was writing under the pen name William Shakespeare. Um, there's, a, there's a few other people who have been argued that they could have been Shakespeare too. But frankly, those arguments are dumb. Like, I hate, I hate to, I, it sounds like I'm using a logical fallacy here. Maybe I am. But um, frankly, you know, I think those arguments come from a place of privilege. I think they're, I think they're ridiculous. But um, fun theory nonetheless. But this guy, he innovated the, the drama. He wrote several comedies. He wrote many tragedies. Uh, he wrote a bunch of what were called history plays. I told you guys before when I, I covered all those English kings, starting from Richard II and leading all the way up to Elizabeth, how I traced those kings. Well, Shakespeare did a play about almost all those kings, like the politics and stuff. So... Uh, that's part, that's part of why I know so much about the, the subject because I've read all his plays. But um, he wrote the history plays, which um, was pretty much gave a history of England for the past couple of hundred years. And he also wrote what was called romances. Uh, rom the dramatic romance was kind of similar to the medieval romance. And, in many ways, they're, they're, they were different in a lot of ways, too. But he wrote two or three of those, uh, The Tempest, The Winter's Tale, Pericles. He wrote a couple of plays that are classified as romances as well. So um, next two weeks, we're dwelling within the genre of tragedy. Um, so of his famous tragedies, I can list a few. Of course, we're reading two of them, Lear and Othello. But he also, of course, is famous for Hamlet. He's famous for Romeo and Juliet. You know, um, Julius Caesar. And oftentimes, Ju Julius Caesar used to be taught a lot in high schools, but uh, it's not really anymore. He wrote Julius Caesar. He wrote Anthony and Cleopatra. He wrote this really big mess of a play called Titus Andronicus, which is about ancient Rome. But this, that play is crazy. <laughs> like, you just have to read it to know. Like, it's completely crazy. Um, I, think, I think I forgot to mention Macbeth. He wrote Macbeth as well. The Scott, it's called Macbeth. It's called the Scottish play. I saw you unmute there, Brad. Yeah, we read Julius Caesar in high school. Did you? Oh. Yeah, we read Caesar, 
Macbeth, Othello, uh, Romeo and Juliet, pretty much all the big ones. Didn't read this one, though. This one was actually kind of a hard read for me. How so? Well, it just has a lot to do with, like, the the political nature of the time, and I'm a little bit uh, uneducated of how all that works. So it was, uh, I had to do a little bit of outside research to get an understanding. Yeah, hopefully we'll unpack a little bit of that today. But, um, yeah, you, you got the full experience in <laughs> you know, high school. Most people only read Romeo or are lucky to read Hamlet. You, you read them all. You read a, quite a few. Um, I know back in high school, I think Romeo and Hamlet was all that I read in high school. Yeah, and my junior year, they switched over to Edgar Allan Poe, and that was pretty much all of that. Poe's po a little easier than, uh, than Shakespeare, to say the least. Brooklyn Kelly, what what's your guys reading? Right, Brooklyn, I know you read Hamlet with me, but uh, besides that, what all other Shakespeare have you encountered? I don't think we actually read any Shakespeare in high school. Honestly, I'm not sure. Which what kind of authors you remember reading in high school? Uh, we read Jane Austen. God, I don't know. I'm I'm spacing. <laughs> Which one? Pride and Prejudice. Yeah, Pride and Prejudice. What's that one name? I think it's Elizabeth something. I only took like two literature classes. We didn't do a whole lot. We did a lot more of grammar than we did actual readings. Right. Kelly, is this, is this your first uh, go around with Shakespeare for the most part? Yeah, we never read Shakespeare in high school. Really, I mean, the only thing we ever read was Romeo and Juliet. And in middle school, I read uh, The Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe. But that's it. We didn't we didn't do readings. We learned just grammar and how to do essays and stuff like that. We never got to read like these big stories. Yeah, it's interesting. Go ahead, Brad. Where'd you guys go to school? Yeah, Scott. Uh, <laughs> I went to Maine. I went to Tug Valley, so that's. I figured you guys might have been Central kids. We barely ever had t actual teachers. We had most substitutes all the time, so I don't know if that was one problem why we didn't read these stories, but. I don't know. At Scott, we didn't. We just didn't take interest. I don't guess in the big stories, so we missed out on all of them. Yeah, it's kind of funny that you guys mentioned uh, you go through all that grammar in high school. Um, I don't know if you guys noticed, <laughs> but you learned all that grammar in high school. Then when you get to college, you still make those grammar mistakes. Um, <laughs> you kind of have to ask why is that. But um, I could go on on a whole rant about this, but my, my theory is they teach you how to look for commas on a test, but they're not really concerned if you're using commas right whenever you write an essay, right? So, yes. right, so I, I need say nothing else on, on that. But... Um, I had Go a ahead. teacher when I was a sophomore. She would not let up. I had her my junior and my sophomore year. She she was a stickler when it came to grammar. No comma splices, no run-ons. I got a lot of C's. <laughs> well, I'm big on the comma splices and run-ons too, Brad. So maybe, maybe she served you well. 
Yeah, my biggest problem right now with writing is a passive voice misuse. I go in and out of the active and passive voice a lot. Yeah, that's that's a that's a big one. Um, Brooklyn's taking uh, technical writing with me right now too, where you're not allowed to write in the passive voice at all. So, uh, I'm in that class too. You're in there too, Brad. Yeah, we yeah, got an so, instructional thing coming up soon, don't we? Yeah, yeah. What did you choose your topic on, Brad? Uh, I'm gonna do replacing a GPU and a computer. Yeah, usually those tech sort of topics work pretty well. Yeah, so uh, I need to get started on that because I've been trying to do this paper and that paper at the same time. Let's do on the 13th, I think. 13th. Um, I think so, yeah. All right. Just, just asking, making sure. Yeah, because I wanted to grade those over break. Speaking of break, is there class next week for this class? Because I know in the religion class there isn't. No, no, not next week. Yeah, when we pick it up after break on the 21st, that'll be when we talk about a fellow. And the 28th, we'll start talking about 12th night. But um, getting back to the play here, so the, let me kind of introduce you to some major things about it. So as I said, um, this play is very much concerned with the nature of power. Like what makes people, what make, what gives these rulers power, right? King Lear, who is our old king here, he seems kind of unaware of this. You know, he gives up. This first scene, Act 1, Scene 1, he gives up all of his claim right, to the throne, to his daughters. Of course, he tries to split his power into three. Right? So he tries to give a third of his kingdom to Goneril. Um, if you, Shakespeare has a pun there, by the way. Um, with the name Goneril, what does what does uh, Goneril sound like? It, hint: It's an STD. <laughs> Gonorrhea. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's not an accident. That's you know that that's that's a pun here from from Shakespeare. Um, yeah, it is. Needless to say, Goneril and Regan aren't too, aren't too, uh, you know, they're, they're not, they're pretty nasty characters. But uh, we got Goneril, we got Regan, of course, we have the, the noble uh, Cordelia. Right? So this play begins in Act One, Scene One, where shit, where Lear is dividing his kingdom into three. And basically, basically, he's a very egotistical old man, right? He's like, tell me how much you love me. Right? And I, then I'll give you my land. Tell me how much you love me. Right? And what does Goneril and Regan do? Right? They, they you know, Lear bends over and then kiss his butt. Right? That, that's pretty much what happens in Act 1, Scene 1. Right? They... they they blow it up. You know, they tell them that they love him more than anything else in the world. Um, then when we get to Cordelia, Cordelia says, I love you according to my bond. No more, no less. Right? So she pretty much tells them there, hey, I love you, but I'm your daughter. I love you just like how a daughter loves her father. No more, no less. So uh, he doesn't like that very much. So he pretty much kicks her to the curb and gives all of his power to Regan and then Goneril, who went out of their way to inflate his ego. 
So um, there we go from the beginning. So we have to ask ourselves what gives people power. I mean, is it um, this? Is, this is kind of a big deal. This question for the time period, because um, kings claim that they had a divine right to rule. Right? Before before this, there's this whole, there was this whole notion in the Middle Ages called the Great Chain of Being. The Great Chain of Being, basically. This was like a, a tier list, a hierarchy of sorts of all of creation. So like at the top of God's creation, you had God, but then you had the angels. And then with the angels, there's all types of different classifications of angels. So you had like archangels you know, as the top. But then maybe you had like a little cherub or something on the more of the bottom. You guys know cherubs like the little baby angels, right? But then when we get to mankind, the top of the tier list when it came to mankind was the king. And then below the king were the nobles. And below the nobles were the peasants. Right, so there's almost the order of importance list here. Um, the higher up you are in the social class, you know, the better, sort of the better of humanity you are. Um, this is one reason why England has always been so concerned about social class, because um, it goes all the way back to the Middle Ages. Social class is one of our biggest things in this play, as we'll, as we'll talk about in a second when I introduce Edmund's character. But um, yeah, I bring this up because before, before the idea was what makes a king a king? Well, God puts him on top of the, of the chain of being, right? It's, it's, a, divine, it's a divine power. Well, we're, we're kind of figuring out with this play. Um, <clears throat> no, that's not really the case. That's not what makes Lear powerful. What makes him powerful is all this land he owns. Right? So whenever <laughs> that's what makes him king, he's in charge of all the land. So um, when he gives his deeds to his land, to his daughters, he becomes a king in name only. He's he, at that point he becomes a figurehead. He's a king in name only. He no longer has any power. So when he gives fifty percent of his land to Regan and fifty percent to Goneril, he's left with zero. So he still thinks that even after he gives up his power, that he should be honored and treated with respect. There's a lot of there's a lot of themes in this play, too, of growing old. Um, how do you treat your elders and all that stuff? Um, he thinks he should still be treated as a king after he does this. Well, he gives it all his power. So I, he, pretty much, he pretty much destroys himself in Act 1, Scene 1, giving away all of his land. So... Um, Brad, you said you said that uh, you were unaware of like the politics of the play. Um, does that add anything to? Uh, yeah, to I wasn't thinking like about the whole like Magna Carta kind of thing, like how they lived, they were ordained to rule by God, or mm. I think it was Magna Carta, wasn't it? Yeah, that was part of it. Yeah. Then uh, King Louis the Fourteenth of France is famous for that too. He came up with that idea that power comes from a divine right. So um, I, th I think he might have been a little after. When did Louis the Fourteenth rule? Yeah, Louis the Fourteenth was well after Shakespeare's life, but he came up with that idea too that his power came from a divine right. 
So, um, again, suddenly we, what we have here in England, the politics of the time, Queen Elizabeth's about ready to die. Uh, what's going to happen? Well, so there's going to be this big power vacuum. Well, Shakespeare is kind of showing how this power vacuum works in this play because Lear relinqu relinquishes everything. Suddenly, we have 50% of the kingdom in Goneril's hands and 50% in Regan's hands. So uh, he pretty much leaves himself open at this point. If he would have divided it up 33% three, each, then he could have gone to stay with Cordelia, who would have actually taken care of her. But because she wouldn't kiss his butt, and uh, go out of her way to do that at the beginning, he kicks her out because of his own ego. So uh, there's your political backdrop for what kicks everything off here. Okay. Yeah, he just completely kicks her to the curb, Cordelia to the curb, right? Just because she refuses to... Um, Like I said, she refuses to um, inflate his ego. But the, um, the great villain of the play, my favorite character in this play is the, is the villain, who's Edmund. Uh, Edmund is our villain here. We, go, we start to uh, understand a little bit about Edmund from Act One, Scene One, from the very first lines of the play. Edmund is the son to the Duke of Gloucester. That's how, he, that's how you say that character's name, by the way, Gloucester. He's the Duke of Gloucester. But we know of the Duke, that he has an older son named Edgar, who, um, Edgar was a child that was had through wedlock, right? So he is the heir to Gloucester's estate. Well, we also have Edmund here, who is not a legitimate child. And um, he isn't going to, he's not going to inherit anything, right? The English have always been very concerned about about their family lines, right? Passing down their family lines throughout multiple generations. They've always been more concerned about that than Americans. But whenever you have these old families that go back centuries, you have to kind of pass down the, pass it down the neatly, I guess you could say, through marriage and wedlock. So, uh, Edmund, just because of the fact that he was had out of wedlock, you know, he has nothing here. So, um, what this is play in a nutshell is him taking advantage of this power vacuum that sprang up in England. And he's working his way up to become king of everything. So, he's trying to work his way up from being a bastard all the way up to being king, right? So that's, it's kind of a fun roller coaster ride to go with him on. Um, if, if you're the type of person to root for the villain as, uh, as I tend to be, um, he's, sort of, he's sort of a sympathetic character in that regard. I guess there's maybe limits to his sympathy because he does some pretty nasty stuff throughout this play, but um, there's a little bit of that here too. Let's look at um, let's read let's read the first few lines of the play. So, so look at thirteen sixty one in your text. Thirteen sixty one. So I want to cover this, and I want to cover his speech in Act One, Scene Two as well. But we have, in this first scene, we have three characters, Clint, or Kent, Loster, and Edmund. So um, let's, got, let's, let's all uh, pick a character here and, and read it. Um, 
So, uh, Kelly, how about you be Kent? Uh, Brad, Brad, you be Gloucester. And uh, Brooklyn, you be Edmund. So let's read up through the middle of page 1362. So let's give it a read. So you guys take it away. Hang on. My book is only goes to like 500 some. Let me find where we're at. It's the very beginning of King Lear in the, in the book. So you're probably in um, the middle book if you have the three volumes. find where you're at Brooklyn yeah just one second I'll let you read uh, Edmund's speech in act one scene two after this Brooklyn so brace yourself okay I'm ready all right so take it away Kelly. You said I was Gloucester, right? I got yeah. the, okay. I got the baby got the clock. Got the clock. <laughs> I thought the king had more affected the Duke of Albany than Cornwall. It always seemed so to us, but now the division of the kingdom, it appears not, which of the dukes he values most. For equalities are so weighed that curiosity and neither can make choice of either's moiety. Is not this your son, my lord? His breeding, sir, hath been at my charge. I have so often blushed to acknowledge him that now I have, now I am brazed to it. I cannot conceive you. Sir, this young fellow's mother could wear upon she grew round wound and had indeed, sir, a son of her cradle ere she had a husband for her bed. Do you smell a fault? I cannot wish the fault undone, the issue of it being so proper. But I have a son, sir, by order of law, some year elder than this, who yet is no dearer in my account, though his knave came from something saucily to the world before <clears throat> he was sent for, yet was his mother fair, there was good sport at his making, and the whore son must be acknowledged. Do you know this noble gentleman, Edmund? No, my lord. My lord of Kent, remember him hereafter as my honorable friend. My services to your lordship. Was I muted? I was. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I must love you and sue to snow you better. Sir, I shall study deserving. He hath been out nine years, and away he shall again. The king is coming. It's good, guys. Um, well, the lines you read there, Brad, give us a lot of perspective on Edmund from the very beginning. Right, right in front of his son, he's like, yeah, my son Edmund, right? He's a bastard, all right, right? I really enjoyed screwing his mother, right? We, we had a lot of fun. So every time I see my son, I think about, about my illicit 
affair that I had with his mother. Right? <laughs> but that's pretty much what he's doing at the beginning, right? He's bragging about um, his exploits when he was a young guy, right? This is my son, all right. I had a lot of fun making him. He's not my legit son, though. That's Andrew. All right, so kind of a kind of an ass, right? Did you did you guys get that? That's kind of what he was doing there, bragging that. Um, about the good old days. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know until at first I didn't pick up on that until he started like talking about the the mother. Yeah, I thought he was just bragging on how he loved his son until he started talking about her. So we don't know from that very first line that Ed, that Edmund's going to turn out bad, right? But um, from the very beginning, we might feel a bit of sympathy for him here, just because you know, he's so ill-treated by his own father. But once we get past the Lear giving his power away scene, one of the famous speeches of the play comes in Act One, Scene Two, the very first speech of the play. You guys don't know your Shakespeare well. Um, one of the things that Shakespeare's characters often do, they will kind of break the fourth wall and look directly at the audience, right, and give like a speech. So these speeches are called soliloquies. All right, so this is this is when a character is kind of revealing their inner thoughts to the audience, and of course, other characters can't hear what they're saying, so that's part of giving a soliloquy. Other characters can't understand what you're saying, so the character is kind of letting the audience in on a little secret. So this is their first soliloquy in this play. Um, so Brooklyn, I'll let you take it. Carry it away. Is reading the Edmund's speech, Act One, Scene Two. Thou nature art my goddess, to thy law my services are bound. Wherefore should I stand in the plague of custom and permit the curiosity of nations to deprive me? For that I am some twelve or fourteen moonshines, lag of a brother. Why a bastard? Therefore, wherefore base? When my dimensions are as well compact. My mind is generous and my shape is true as honest madam's issue. Why brand they us with base, with baseness, bastardy, base, base, who in the lusty stealth of nature take more composition and fierce quality than doth with a dull, stale, tired bed. Go to the creating a whole tribe of fops got tween asleep and wake. Well then, Legitimate Edgar, I must have your land. Our father's love is to the bastard Edmund as to the legitimate. Fine word, legitimate. Well, my legitimate, if this is letter speed and my invention thrive, Edmund the base shall top the legitimate. I grow, I prosper. Now God stands up for bastards. All right, so good, good. Yeah, so he, he's letting you in on, a, on his plan here, right? You know, uh, nature stand up for bastards. Right? You know, he's he's pretty much calling out this injustice here, right? Um, why is it that just because of his birth, what does that have to do with his uh, social standing? Like, why does why should that prohibit him from rising in the world? Uh, fair question, right? But it does. It does. Like if you were an illegitimate child, like there's only so many things in society you could do. So um, that's a hard concept for us Americans to understand in a way. But uh, in England, like if you were an illegitimate child, like it was very hard. So um, yeah, he. I thought he's they were called asides when they addressed the audience directly. 
Yeah, there's they have a side. I'm talking about mostly whenever they give a, a direct speech, sort of like this. Yeah, that that's called a soliloquy. Oftentimes, Shakespeare in the stage directions will write a side uh, to show you that the character turns aside to the audience. So that's often a stage direction that they'll throw in to show a soliloquy's coming. What do you guys think about Edmund here? Are you guys sympathetic to him? Um, are you guys kind of rooting for him here in a way? I'm I'm, try, I'm trying to lead you down that interpretation, right? But maybe maybe I'm bringing my own bias into the play, right? What What do you guys make of this character? I mean, I would probably do the same thing if I was him. His dad's like super rude and super obnoxious about it. And he kind of has no chance. I mean, I would do what I could to move up in the world. It would suck if you had all these siblings that got all this power and just because you had a different mother, you didn't get any of it. He's definitely one of like the more reasonable villains that you encounter in Shakespeare. What was, what was the bad guy in Julius Caesar? I can't remember his name. It was like Rudy. Brutus's friend. Brutus and Cassius. Cassius. Cassius, like, he's probably the best example of just, like, a straight Shakespearean bad guy. Like, you don't root for Cassius at all at any point throughout the story. Brutus, on the other hand, maybe you have a case for him. Yeah. It was Cassius's fault. <laughs> Macbeth is another good one for a bad guy. Yeah, you can sympathize with him a little bit too, like for why he wants to take the throne over. Um, Othello, which will be our next play, Yago is pretty much just a straight up. He There's not a lot of gray with Yago, right? He's very evil. Um, just for the sake of being evil. Yeah, um, I, I kind of agree with, with you there, Brooklyn. Um, right from the beginning, right? It's kind of hard not to take his side a little bit. Of course, Edgar really doesn't do anything to him. So Edgar suddenly becomes the victim here of his little scheme that he comes up with. Um, forging a let he forges a letter saying that Edgar wrote it, saying that he wants to get rid of his dad so he can take over the, the estates. And, and so that's that's how he gets Edgar out of the picture here. Edgar, of course, through the next couple of acts, turns into. So Edgar goes from being a noble aristocratic kid who gets all the all the privilege. So he suddenly pretends to be this poor homeless man called Poor Tom. Right? Poor Tom seems kind of mad. Um, seems he seems like he doesn't quite have it going on upstairs. And so, so Edgar throughout the next couple of acts pretends to be this poor, this poor person, especially when they encounter Lear um, out in the wild. So um, we have a couple of other characters that we need to introduce as well. The fool. The Fool is definitely one that we need to talk about. Um, Kent as well. Kent, of course, is Lear's sort of right-hand man. Right? He's the servant who's very lo loyal to Lear. And Lear, in the beginning of the play, goes crazy and kicks him out too. He banishes him. 
So Kent kind of dresses up as somebody else and pretends to be somebody else just so he can stay with Lear. So um, despite Lear going crazy and banishing him, Kent is still loyal and sticks with, with, uh, with Lear here. That, of course, there's that one scene, I think, in Act 2 where he gets put in the stocks, right? They put him in the stocks so that because uh, he starts a fight. So um, Lear, of course, is like, how dare you put, put my friend in the stocks? So that starts a whole big conflict right in the middle of Act 2. Kent's pretty cool, right? You know, he he's loyal, even 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 if he gets banished from the kingdom, right? He's still loyal to, to Lear. The fool, though, the fool is an interesting character, and uh, it requires some context because we're going to run into another fool character whenever we read Twelfth Night. But all this stuff that we've been talking about with power and the land ownership. And all of this stuff comes into play with this character of the fool. Um, basically, the fool plays a lot of word games with Lear. So this, this character of the fool, of course, these kings would have these court jesters. The court jesters on the chain of being were sort of considered like the, the worst of humanity. Like they're below, like even the peasant, the lowest peasant in a way. The court jester was there to meant to entertain the king, keep the king, keep the king occupied. Well, this this court jester is all about sort of matching wits with Lear. So Shakespeare's fool knows everything, right? Shakespeare's fool is is the smartest character in the play. So there's a little irony here. He's called the fool but nobody takes him seriously just because of his social standing. But he knows everything that's happening in the play, and he calls Lear out on being dumb. And that's basically what we get here. So Act 1, Scene 4. We get a whole big interchange here. Let's, let's read through some of this too. Um, 13, seven, page 1376 for me, it's about line uh, first full enter. About line 76. This is when we uh, first encounter the fool. So uh, I'll, I'll read the part of the fool but we need a Lear and um, a Kent. So um, Brad, how about you be Lear? Brooklyn, how about you take Kent? Okay. So page 13, 76, about line 76. The first line of the fool says, let me hire him too. Here's my coxcomb. So you guys see where I'm at? You said I'm Kent, right? Uh, yes. Br okay. Brad, I gave Lear. Okay, I'm sorry. My internet's not doing too hot right now, so. You with us now? Yeah. I'll start. Um, how now, my pretty knave, how doest thou? Sir, sir, you were best take my coxcomb. Yeah, that's pretty bad. You didn't, you didn't hear much of that? You didn't hear me, did you? Yeah, I heard you. Oh, okay. Well, I didn't hear it. It froze as soon as I got done talking. 
So that's your line now, Brooklyn. Why, fool? So uh, where are we? Right after your line that you just read. Oh, we're froze again. Let me get on my computer. I'm the fool. Get off mobile. You're uh, Ken. Uh, give me just a second. While we're waiting on him, uh, I sort of we started lecturing and didn't really uh, ask you guys much about your reading experience with this. Mr. Kelly, you said um, it started out rough for you, but you kind of got into it. You want to talk? You want to talk about that? Yeah, at first I was confused at like what they were talking about, but where we went over it, like where we just had read before about him boasting about his son being out of wedlock like that's where I got confused at and then like where I told you in the messages I looked them up on like YouTube and stuff and felt like people actually reading them because with these plays like I forget to like notice that they're switching names and different people were talking so I confused myself mm -hmm. so I would play it on my phone and follow along with them and like hearing the different voices yeah. I understood it way better and I did it with Dr. Faustus, too. But I love this bomb. story. I need to do it, Bob. See Brad connecting with us here. Is that better, Brad? You with us now, Brad? If you are, you're muted. Yeah, I'm here. Should be working. I switched over to my desktop. It's got a wired connection instead of wireless. Should be a little bit better. All right, let's, let's start over. Um, I'll read, let me hire him too. Here's my coxcomb. How now, my pretty knave? How dost thou? Sir, you were best take my coxcomb. Oh, that's not me. Whoops. Next line's you, Brooklyn. Why, fool? Why, fool? Why, for taking one's part that's out of favor? Nay, and thou canst not smile as the wind sits. Thou catch cold shortly. There, take my coxcomb. Why, this fellow has banished two of his daughters and did the third a blessing against his will. If thou follow him, thou must needs wear my coxcomb. How thou, thou uncle, would I had two coxcombs and two daughters? Why, my boy? If I gave them all my living, I'd keep my coxcombs myself. There's mine. Beg another of thy daughters. Take heed, Sarah, the whip. Truth, a dog must to kennel. He must be whipped out when the lady Brock may stand by the fire and stink. A pestilent gall to me. Sir, I'll teach thee a speech. Do. Mark it, uncle. Have more than thou showest, speak less than thou knowest. Lend less than thou owest, ride more than thou goest. Learn more than thou trowest, set less than thou throwest. Leave thy drink and thy whore, and keep in a door. And thou shalt have more than two tens to a score. This is nothing, fool. Then tis like the breath of an undefeated lawyer. You gave me nothing for it. Can you make no nothing? Use of nothing, Uncle? Why, no, boy. Nothing can be made out of nothing. Pray thee, tell him so much the rent of his land comes to, he will not believe a fool. A bitter fool. Dost know the difference, my boy, between a bitter fool and a sweet one? No, lad. Teach me. 
that Lord that counseled thee to give away thy land, come place him here by me. Do thou for him stand. The sweet and bitter fool presently appear. The one in Motley here, the other found out there. Dost thou call me fool, boy? All thy other titles thou hast given away, that thou was born with. This is not altogether fool, my lord. No faith, lords and great men will not let me. If I had a monopoly out, they would have part on it. Ladies, too, they will not let me have all the fool to myself. They'll be snatching. Uncle, give me an egg and I'll give thee two crowns. What two crowns shall they be? Well, after I've cut the egg in the middle and eat up the meat, the two crowns of the eggs. When thou clovest thy crown in the middle and gavest away both parts, thou borest thine ass on thy back over the dirt. Thou wast little wit in thy bald crown when thou gavest the golden one away. If I speak like myself in this, let him be whipped that first finds it so. Fools had never less grace in a year, for wise men are grown foppish. And know not how their wits to wear, their manners are so apish. When were you wont to be so full of songs, Sirrah? I have used to it, uncle, ever since thou madest thy daughters thy mothers. For when thou gavest them the rod and puts down, uh, down the own breeches, they, then they for sudden joy did weep. And I for sorrow sung that such a king should play Bo Peep and go the fools among. Pray thee, uncle, keep a schoolmaster that can teach thy fool to be. I wouldn't fain learn him to be. And you lie, Sarah, will have you whipped. I marvel what can thou and thy daughters, Lor. They'll have me whipped for speaking true. They'll have me whipped for living. And sometimes I'm whipped for holding my peace. I'd rather be any kind of thing than a fool. And yet I would not be thee, uncle. Thou hast paid thy there, or thou hast paired thy wit on both sides and left nothing in the middle. Here comes one of the pairings. How now, daughter? What makes that frontlet on? Methinks you are too much of late, it's frown. Thou wast a pretty fellow when thou hast no need to care for her frowning. Now thou art an O without a figure. I am better than thou art now. I am a fool. Thou art nothing. We'll stop it there. So, But um, hopefully you guys, uh, as Brooklyn and I read that, hopefully you guys picked up on some of that word play there. Right. The fool was mocking Lear here for giving away his power. Right, He said, <laughs> the very last line that I read, I'm a fool, you're nothing. Right, So the fool is kind of even saying here, as low as I am on the social totem pole, you're even below me now because you gave away all your land. You're nothing now. I love, I love the image of the cracked egg and the crown. Like he cracked the egg in two, gave away the crowns, and all the all the brains came out in the middle. <laughs> so well, the fool here is kind of showing Lear, right? Here's how power works, and you gave up your power. You're an idiot. I'm supposed to be the idiot here. You're the idiot, right? That's that's kind of what's going on there with with that uh, wordplay. There was ever a roast in Shakespeare. I believe that one was it. Right. <laughs> yeah, of course, Lear threatens to whip him, right? Don't get too close here. Don't, don't touch a nerve too close or you'll be whipped. And the fool's like, well, no matter what I do, I'm whipped, right? There will be a point in this play. Um, I don't know if we got. I don't know if we got there in that, at the end of Act Three or not. 
there will be a point in this play where the fool and the, the fool will stop being in the play. I guess there's going to be a moment in the play where there's no more need for that character to be there. But if you guys notice, um, the fool is never in a scene with Cordelia because normally uh, the actor who plays Cordelia also plays the fool. But that's because they're never in a scene together. So that's that's a fun little uh, fun little fact for you. Most of the time, the fool actor is also the Cordelia. We didn't even get to talk about King Lear being naked and out in the storm and all that stuff. That was in Act Three. But I do feel like we did a pretty good job today acclimating ourselves to the play and the themes and the characters. So um, as you guys finish the play for Wednesday, just, just finish it out and keeping our discussion in mind. And uh, we can kind of come back Wednesday and look at some passages and kind of break it down, how it ends and, and all that good stuff. Okay. So you guys, you guys, you guys feel good about the reading now? Now that we talked about it. Yeah, I think we got it. Good. Yeah, I think I think you guys will find like Shakespeare's got a reputation. Like, like he's made out to be harder than he is. Um, he's at like I think in high school and stuff they don't really go into depth about a lot of these jokes and stuff like um, you eat, like if you're in a high school classroom you have never talked about that passage where Gloucester is talking about how much fun he had with Edmund's wife and stuff right a lot a lot of his content is very risque very uh you're very dirty in a way, right? Shakespeare is a fun author. I think oftentimes he's painted as this old boar, right? But uh, he's anything but if he's taught right. So, yeah, have, have fun with the rest of it. High school teachers kind of have to keep it, you know, pretty PG rated when it comes to teaching stuff. Yeah, you always got the crazy uh, thematic parent, right, who they have to be afraid of. Um, college is a bit different. I've read some pretty nasty stuff in my English classes in college. Right, well, even, even a lot of the stuff we read in here is pretty pretty crazy and out there, so. Yeah, but I took a lot of, like, uh, sci-fi base, you know, literature classes because that's kind of what i'm into reading and there was this one i can't remember the title of it but it was like this dude ended the world and the only thing that was left was clones they were like pasty white skin and i can't, I can't remember the name of it i have to look it up yeah sci-fi is a genre that i'm admittedly not as well read up on as i should be I like a lot of the old 60s novels from like Robert Heinlein and authors like that. Well, guys, uh, I won't hold you up anymore. So uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Good luck finishing up your papers. Okay, we'll see you Wednesday for the rest of, of the year.